A portion of this video is sponsored by LastPass. Hey guys, it's Max. Today I am finally doing my long-term review of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. The Pocket 4K is a fantastic camera and an absolute seal for $1,300 or $1,000 if you include the license key for DaVinci Resolve Studio. When Blackmagic announced this camera in AB, I wasn't thinking of buying another camera, but once I saw its design and capabilities, and of course I saw the price, I knew I had to order it, which I did about 5 minutes later. It's been just over 9 months since I received this bad boy and unfortunately I've decided to sell it because it's just too expensive. Now by itself, it's a cheap camera, especially if you want to shoot 4K60 RAW, but once I started incorporating it into actual paid work and working with the files and posts, it started to really cost me. There's a few more reasons as well, so hear me out and consider my point of view. It could save you a lot of headaches, give you better shots, and make you a lot more money in the long run. For this review, I don't want to get too much into the hardware since you've probably heard it all before, but focus more on my personal experience and perspective. Let's start out with the exterior, and overall, I love it. I really like having this DSLR style design, especially if you want to hand hold it and keep the camera small. The grip is large and very comfortable, it might actually be a little bit too large if you have smaller hands. I love the quarter inch thread here at the top, it makes it so that's very secure when you put a cage around it. And uh, the kind of things that I don't like about the body are the microphones here and the front, along with the battery door cover, which is super cheap feeling and it kind of barely closes. The button layout is awesome and it makes it really easy for people coming from hybrid cameras to move over, which as you've probably seen, there's been a ton of people that are trying to make this move. As far as the inputs and outputs, we have a huge selection. We have a mic and headphone jack, full-size HDMI, 12 volt power input, mini XLR, and USB Type-C. I love the large 5 inch touchscreen display on the back. It's surprisingly bright and I can use it outside in most conditions. It's actually sharp enough to manually focus because it is 1080p. I really just wish that it would be able to tilt up and down. And I think for most people, they'd probably be willing to pay another $200 just to have that feature alone. On the display is the best menu system I've used in any camera. You can do everything by touch and it's laid out very well. The only software changes that I would like to ask for is to have waveforms for video, since that's very helpful to see where different parts of your image fall. Now let's touch on another excellent area, and that is the image. If you take the time to shoot using the film mode, you expose properly, and you get good at grading, the color profile is very pleasing. The colors look very natural, and the way it handles exposure makes it easier to get a cinematic look compared to most hybrid cameras. As far as the audio, for the most part the experience was surprisingly good. I used an XLR adapter and the camera's built-in phantom power to run shotgun mics and the results were very clean. Now with a 3.5mm input, the results do get a bit worse. You have to set the gain very high, so you really want to feed it a strong signal. I ended up using the Sennheiser XS Wireless, which is too hot for most of my cameras, but it's a perfect pair for the Pocket 4K. I love being able to split the inputs so I can run both an XLR and a wireless kit for backup or two separate inputs for interviews. One big downside is the 3.5mm input doesn't provide power, so you need something like the Rode VideoMic Pro if you want to record good ambient sound. Moving back to the image, the dynamic range could be very good if you're careful and you know what you're doing. It's rated at 13 stops of dynamic range, but where the bulk of that range is maintained really varies. The camera uses a dual native ISO sensor which helps in low light, but you have to choose your ISO carefully as you can tell by this chart. The times I really focus on dynamic range is when I want to preserve my highlights, and in order to do so properly, you really want to be at 1000 ISO, meaning you do have to use NDs. And that's when you can run into IR issues which give you kind of magenta shadows. Blackmagic Design is known for this, so you need to be careful when using strong IDs, and it's best to use an IR cut filter. I'll link the ND and IR cut combo filters that I used in the description. At 100 ISO and at 1200 ISO, the camera maintains the best shadow detail, so this camera does really well for low light, both in terms of noise and dynamic range if you can keep it at 1200 ISO, and for highlights, dynamic range is best at 1000. Other cameras have kind of a variety as well, which is why most cameras raise the base ISO in log mode, but it doesn't seem like there's as big of a difference with those cameras as there is with the Pocket 4K. Maybe it's a dual native ISO sensor, but shooting at 100 ISO really blows out your highlights. 
Along with that, I also noticed that shooting in ProRes uh, also does lower your dynamic range, uh, which wasn't the case for the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro, and because of that, that made me want to almost always shoot with the Blackmagic RAW. Some would argue that the Blackmagic RAW is not true RAW, and in fact, it is partially debayered in the camera, but personally, I don't care. You can adjust the ISO, you can adjust the white balance in post, and it's still very easy to edit, and it offers small file sizes if you need them. Blackmagic RAW 12 to 1 is really small, but I did notice some artifacting, so I'd personally suggest sticking to 8 to 1 if you want to keep file sizes small, or Q5 for constant quality with a variable codec. A lot of people complained about losing cinema DNG in this camera, and I wish that we could have both at the same time, but overall I think Blackmagic RAW is a real winner. Now before I talk about the main reasons why I am selling my Blackmagic Pocket 4K, I want to thank LastPass for sponsoring this video. LastPass relieves the burden of remembering passwords. Stop getting locked out of your accounts, making combinations of names and dates for your passwords, or even worse, using the same password for every site, and let LastPass fill in your usernames and passwords for you. If you're not using LastPass, you are really missing out. Not only will it keep your passwords on autopilot by keeping track of everything, auto-generating new passwords and logging you in automatically, it is also free. And that's not some cut down version that's unusable, it actually has a ton of features like cross-device syncing and unlimited password storage for free. Setting up is extremely easy. Use the link or the button down below to quickly set up an account and download the web extension or the mobile app. All of your new passwords will be safely stored and automatically used on websites and even iOS and Android apps, which is so convenient. It will even allow you to use your fingerprint or face ID to log in, which is even easier. Not only that, but it will also fill out forms, addresses, and credit card payments for you, saving you a ton of time when you shop. If you're wondering how secure this is, don't worry. LastPass protects your data at every step using 256-bit encryption, and your data is encrypted and decrypted on the device. That way, LastPass can't even access your data. LastPass can even test your security and give you a score where you have some weak spots, maybe like uh, compromised passwords, weak passwords, old passwords, and along with that, they'll tell you how to fix it. You have nothing to lose but a ton of security to gain. Download LastPass right now for free using the link or the button below, and if you decide to upgrade to premium, it's extremely affordable. Once again, thanks to LastPass for sponsoring this portion of the video. As I mentioned, I really like the image coming out of the Pocket 4K once I put some effort into it. But unfortunately, if you're trying to work quickly and want a great image from the camera, that's where I start to have a few issues. The RAW files take more time to get a great look compared to the C200 RAW or Proverse RAW from the FS5. The Pocket 4K does have a video mode if you need a quick turnaround, but personally, I'm not a fan of the look and the highlights clip much easier. In my opinion, the only way to get a great looking image out of the Pocket 4K is by using that film mode. Unfortunately, if you do a variety of paid work, that is not always possible. In many cases, I could have used extended video, but at that point, I might as well shoot with a hybrid camera and have a great looking image out of the camera. In some of those cases, the Rec. 709 profiles, I really prefer them over the extended video in here. Um, and using those will actually give me some other benefits compared to using the Pocket 4K. So that is the first reason why I am selling this camera and why it's getting expensive. I personally work on a variety of projects with different budgets and not all of them can afford the amount of time needed for post-production getting the footage from the Pocket 4K to look as good as it should. So I end up having to put my own time into it if I want it to look great or settling on a subpar image. And the problem isn't only with color grading, but other things like having fixed pattern noise if you don't get your exposure right, or the fact that you don't get any lens correction, uh, any aberration or distortion correction. Now, this may not be an issue with good high quality cinema lenses, but a lot of newer lenses are actually choosing to go for a softer correction instead of having it in the optics in order to have smaller and lighter weight lenses. So when you're using this 12 to 35 on the GH5, the image looks great, but the same lens on the Pocket 4K has a lot of distortion. This means that there's extra time in post having to fix these issues, especially with zoom lenses where you can't just you know, put in one value for the correction. Uh, whereas other cameras, even ones that shoot raw, can correct for this. Along with that, like most cinema cameras, this does not have sensor stabilization, which is totally fine. But if you do want some smoother handheld footage, lens stabilization does not work nearly as well as with native bodies. 
Because of this, the camera has even less of a pocket cinema form factor. Ultimately, you really have to rig it up if you want to get good results. Now, I made a full video on how I set up this camera for different jobs, including every single piece of my full rig. And I don't want this video to be too long, so I'll just go ahead and link that video down in the description. But it takes a whole lot to get this camera set up for a shoot, depending on what you're doing. From adding, say, battery solutions to get around the terrible battery life, an external display if you want to shoot in low angles or shoot interviews, to adding an external SSD if you want to shoot most projects without having to use a ton of SD cards or expensive CFast cards. This is the second reason why I'm selling, the fact that it needs so much support to be usable when there is other cameras out there that really don't need anywhere near as much add-ons or accessories. Once you buy everything for this camera, the price can double or even triple, and even then it's not as usable for a lot of work compared to other cinema cameras, one of those being the C200. Now yes, that camera is $6,500, but you get a much more capable camera that will make you a lot more money in the long run, while still offering a very pleasing image with superior dynamic range, no fixed pattern noise, no IR issues, built-in NDs, 4-channel audio recorder, an EVF, uh, better hand-holding, backup recording, great battery life without having to have a huge external battery, um, a great MP4 codec for the times that you don't need RAW, Full sensor, 1080p, 120 frames per second slow motion instead of a two times crop over the micro four thirds sensor, and other things like face detection autofocus, which is very helpful for interviews and other shooting situations. So I actually went over every paid project that I shot with this camera and the time that it took for both prepping and for post. Overall, I made a lot less money shooting with this camera than I did doing projects with Canon, Sony, or Panasonic. Shooting with it was fun and I did enjoy the flexibility of Blackmagic RAW, but at the end of the day, you really have to ask yourself what your main goal is. Do you create videos for fun that don't need to pay employees and feed a family, or do you need to create good work that is also profitable? Now, I am not all about money, and this camera is cheap enough that I was actually planning to keep it for just personal projects, but after my last shoot, I actually made the choice to sell it. And this final and third reason is the amount of usable footage that I can get with it. After shooting both paid and personal projects with this camera, I've been noticing how much longer it takes me to get each shot, and some of the times where I've actually missed shots because of you know the camera and extra rigging that is required. Now this part really sucks the most for me. If I was using a hybrid camera, I could have had good metering modes or image stabilization, or if I was shooting, say, with a C200, I could have built-in NDs and I can have autofocus. And both of these situations, I can actually throw those cameras on a gimbal and I can use a number of autofocusing modes to easily track subjects. Now, it's not that I can't successfully use the Pocket 4K without those creature comforts. I absolutely can and have. It's the fact that in most cases, I can get way more usable shots, which will make both my personal and the paid projects turn out better. And that's what matters most of all. So overall, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K is very intriguing and it's a very capable camera. I see so many people wanting to ditch their other cameras or ditching them to pick one of these up, and this may be a decent choice for you even with its limitations. It's a $1,300 camera or maybe a $1,000 camera, which is capable of 4K60 RAW with a very pleasing image if you have the time and the budget to work with it. But for a lot of people, I think a modern hybrid camera, especially the ones that are coming out with really capable 10-bit codecs, um, that's probably a much better choice. And if you do definitely need a cinema camera, I would look at some other options, like one that I mentioned a ton throughout this video, one of my favorites, the Canon C200. That just recently got a price drop and it is super capable and super flexible for a wide variety of shooting situations without the need to rig it up and buy a bunch of different accessories. And even then it is not as capable. So thank you guys for watching this video. This has been Max with my long-term nine month review of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Let me know your thoughts and opinions down in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.